Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What? Look at Horatio's on the camera. This is great. We got to have a good morning. A Sunil. All right, let's get this uh, service started. Uh, I wanted to read a scripture. It's in Psalm 34, and uh, it says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glor glorify the Lord with me. Let us all exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. And I, and I saw this verse this morning and I was thinking about like how we are just mesmerized by, you know, these magnificent, you know, sanctuaries and cathedrals. And, and a lot of times we are mesmerized by that so much that we forget that it's really about the people that are inside of it that matters and that God really cares about. God doesn't really care about if we have a building or if God, if we have this magnificent place to meet in, God really sees inside of our hearts. And, you know, and as this verse says, it says, I will extol the Lord at all times. And I have a little dog squeaking in the background here joyfully. Um, and uh, he sought, I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. And, you know, even during this time, we can have a tendency to be, you know, fearful and, um, you know, get caught up in, you know, the pandemic and things like that. But this, you know, this passage says that, you know, if we're praising God, if we're glorifying, glorying in the Lord, if we are exalting his name, that we can be delivered from those fears and, you know, we can take solace in God. So we're going to start the first song um, in just a moment. Um, that's hard to do this. Uh, all right, now I have to share my screen again. Um, so we're going to sing the Spirit's Fire. Oops. <laughs> Through our veins, the spirit's 
opportunity to uh, introduce the next song. Um, and it reminded me, it's I'll be listening. Um, and I wanted to just uh, share a story about when um, I went to the Quaker Bridge Mall to shop like a lot of us do, not this year, several years ago, more than several years ago. And um, I uh, came out to my car after an hour shopping. And uh, there were wooden two by fours under my tires and my wheels. And I was like, oh, panicked. I was like, oh my gosh, what happened? And the security guy goes, he came rolling by and he said, we put them under your car because we were announcing your license plate number for the last hour and you didn't come out or you didn't respond and your car was rolling back because you didn't put your emergency brake on. And I thought listening is something that you don't do in the mall unless you're intentional. You know, you're at the airport, if you're not expecting your name to be called, you're not listening for every announcement out there. You just do what you do. And that's what listening is, it's intentional. And I think this song is about that, you know, when the savior calls, I will answer. When he calls mm -hmm. for me, I will hear him. And we're hearing him because we're listening for him. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I wonder, within myself, whether I hear his spirit, whether I hear his call, whether I'll know I'm being called to heaven because I'm not listening. Even mm -hmm. though we could be saved, we might not be um, listening to for his voice. When the Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will hear. When the Savior calls, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Oh, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Why? 
Okay, Kenny. You okay. Are. Good morning, everybody. Morning. How's everybody doing? It's been a. Uh, this is my wife Anna, and Yasin hanging out in the side here. For those who don't know him, there he is. And so here he is. We'd like to welcome you all today. We're going to have a wonderful service because we are all together, and that's the most important thing in life that we're all together, and that we we all wish for in one God. Um, I want you to turn to Philippians 4, 6, and 7. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, supplication, with, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the and, peace of God, which surpasses me. all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. Well, we're going to have a wonderful service today, and I hope everybody had a wonderful turkey day. I know Paris ate too much, but that's beside the point. <laughs> and we have a few uh, a few announcements that we're going to make for you right now. Hey, man. You know, I don't know what's with everyone coming on me about me eating, all right? Like, I haven't gained that much weight, all right? Y'all need to. Oh, it's the more. vision. <laughs> <laughs> It puts 10 pounds on you. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a camera. You know the camera. Yeah. It's a camera. Church, <laughs> church is so good to see everyone. Uh, I want to start us off today because uh, we did the, as a Mercer church in conjunction with Central Jersey and the uh, SurePoints, we were able to give away the Thanksgiving baskets. Uh, and for the first time this year uh, that we've been doing this, we really gave most of the Thanksgiving food baskets that we gave out weren't necessarily for members in the church. It was to the community and those who are need, who are in need within the community. And so it was an awesome time to just serve uh, and help out with just so many people uh, within our local community, within Central Jersey and the shore. Uh, but when we were doing this, we did something really cool and unique this year is that we had uh, an art contest for the children. And so I want to present the results for the art contest. We're going to present the winners. So I get a little drum roll for our winners. Thank you, Neil. Hitting the drum, hitting the drum. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you. Dad. Okay, here we go. So the winners for 2020's art contest, we have right here the Alexander reward is goes to Sade. Where's Sade? Sade even on? Is she on? There she goes, Sade, there you go. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Sade, and this is her artwork that she put in there, all right, the 3D. She got the front and the back of the turkey, you know, took them out. Nice smoked turkey, I like that. that I'm sure it tastes good. Uh, we had another another uh, award goes to, it's the the Mark, how do you pronounce that? Shalingard? You know, that's, uh, that's, that's Andrea. She named this one, you know, <laughs> or, but that goes to James. Where's James at? Oh, okay. See James, but here we go. This is James right here. You know, this is his work. Awesome. <laughs> and the number one, the grand winner is for the 2020 art contest. <laughs> the Pablo Picasso award goes to the snipe girls. 
on, on the where the Snipe Girls are. And there's actually a caption Hi. by the judge, right? The judge gave this caption on why this one uh, was the number one winner. Uh, the caption says this, says, I chose uh, this one as the best in the show because without any words, the artist captured the spirit of Thanksgiving. Uh, families and friends together under one roof, sitting around the table to celebrate a meal together and enjoy one another's company. And so this is an awesome work of art here. So the Pablo Picasso world goes to the Snipe Girls. Can we all give them a round of applause? You can unmute yourselves. You can cheer for them. A little cheer in there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And so all our contestants, you guys all did a great job. So we're going to throw it back to, throw the mic back to, to Kenny. Mm -hmm. And we'll continue on. All right, we have a few announcements to make today. Uh, Paris, you're going to, we have oh. the Monday. Yep. You're on it. You're on it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Monday, the morning devotional, which is every day, has been wonderful for all of us, especially me. I gives me a chance to 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 get with God right off the bat in the day, and we just want all of you to, to make sure that you check it out. So mm -hmm. it's right on the you know, the wonderful Zoom that we've all come to know and love. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the women's book club is going to be Monday at 7 p.m. Please contact Zainabu for the link. Yeah. Uh, and we have the women's midweek coming up this week at 7 p.m. So yeah. make sure you, all you ladies get together, 7 p.m. Oh, actually, sorry. Huh? Uh, we will not have women's midweek this week. Ah. I'm sorry, it's the ninth. I apologize. Okay. All right, no problem. No. We, we, we move on. The ninth, we'll move on. <laughs> we'll move on. Save this for next week. There we go. Okay, Life Group Leaders Meeting will be Thursday at 7 p.m. And men's prayer meeting is 7 a.m. Saturday, December 5th, which is uh, just a wonderful time that we get together in the park. We're able to uh, praise Lord and just have a great time and just fellowship. So make sure you come, all you men out there. We'd like to welcome, once again, the new family to Mercer, the Branch, the branch family. Let's give them a round of applause. Glad that you joined us today. From the North Jersey Church. And they just moved to Hamilton, New Jersey. <laughs> so welcome, welcome branches. <laughs> we're glad you're here with us. And tonight, today we're just very, very glad to have somebody that we all know and love. Canton Yang, our recent graduate from Princeton University, is going to be the one who's going to be speaking to us today and, and, and sharing with us the words of the Lord. So right away, let's have, have a prayer from Paris and then we'll get right on to. Oh, no, that's you, Kenny. Go for it. Oh, it's me. Okay, well, <laughs> <laughs> Father God, let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Uh, please watch out for all those who are sick and suffering, who are going through these changes that we all are going through right now. Um, let's, let's look out for our children and for everyone that we love and make sure that they're well, because this is a world which now has been quite different for all of us. But we will survive. Why we will survive is because we have the Lord on our side. We have God in our hearts. And every day we try to get take a one step a little closer to him so that we can live in the light. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. 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 So with that, guys, I'm going to be sharing the communion before we come into the sermon. Uh, again, just want to welcome the, the Branch family. It's good to have you guys uh, here. Uh, with us and um, yeah and Pedro if you want to change that 7 a.m. thing for the prayer morning we're still open for changing it to 7 p.m. you know they could change the a to a p it'll work totally fine I think uh, but guys with that I want to jump into our communion and so guys did you enjoy your Thanksgiving all right did everyone enjoy their Thanksgiving I know this was yes. an abnormal Thanksgiving but you know, I tend to, there's one specific scripture I, I look into a lot whenever I think about this time of year, and you guys have heard this before, because I've shared about it before, and I'm going to get into it, but it's funny because, you know, the day before Thanksgiving, me and my wife, we were watching movies or doing something, and my wife was like, I haven't started cooking anything, and I was like, you know, in my mind, she's like panicking about cooking a Thanksgiving dinner, but I'm like, you know, it's just us, like, I don't know why she's 
worried about it. It's just, we're not, because typically we have so many people over the house. So this year I was like, it's just us. I don't know why she's worried. So I was like, girl, don't worry about it. Relax. You'll get up tomorrow. You can cook it up. It'll be fine. Fast forward to Thanksgiving day, right? My wife wakes up in the morning. I don't know what time she woke up. I don't know what time. All I know is this. I got out of bed about 10, 11 o'clock, okay? Don't judge me. It was Thanksgiving day, all right? So I stayed in a little later. And mind you, I come out of my room. She did nothing the night before. And all of a sudden, at 10, 11 o'clock, I come out. She done cook salmon, steak, turkey, fried chicken. What else she have? Mac and cheese, uh, Brussels sprouts, cornbread, corn bake. Like, I was like, how, did, what, how many others do we have in this house that you did all this? Like, it don't make no sense. Like, how all this happened? And I mean, and it was done. Like, she was done. And I'm like, okay, you know, and I had to let her know, I am so grateful for you. Like, I, I am a lucky man, right? And I bring this up because this is, uh, it's funny, if, we, if you guys ever thought about what it means to really show gratitude, right? Like, what does that really look like to show gratitude, to show someone that you appreciate them, to show someone that you acknowledge them, uh, that you, you, you see the value that they bring to you in your life, right? And, and that's super important, and we're called to do that. God calls us to do that. But I also want to talk about this thing, a nasty word called ingratitude. None of us like this word, ingratitude. Ingratitude is the absence of recognition for something that was done and deserves it. You know, and the funny thing about ingratitude is this, that when you're the victim, it's so obvious that someone is being ungrateful, isn't it? Like when you're the victim, you, you know that someone's being ungrateful, you know? Uh, but when you're the perpetrator of ingratitude, it's always invisible. You never know it. Like you never know that you're being ungrateful, you know? But those around you, the victims, they know you're being ungrateful. And the recipient is always aware, but the culprit is rarely aware of what it means that they are at that present moment being ungrateful. And I gotta confess, I struggle with ungrateful people. You know, I struggle with ungrateful people, you know, depending on, you know, and I think, I think if we're all honest, I know Koi is looking at me like I'm a sinner, but whatever. Okay. Look, I know if we're all honest, depending on how you respond to my acts of generosity with my time, influence and resources previously will determine if I am generous with you next time. But are we all that way? Stop, Pedro. You lying, bro. Stop lying. I see you. We gauge this stuff. Depending on how you respond is how I will. If you're grateful when I do something and I serve you, oh, whatever you need, I'll be there. But if you show ingratitude when I sacrifice to help you out, oh, oh, it's a, it's a struggle. You know, and I could be a one and done person, man. Once you once you do it one time, I'm already looking at you sideways moving forward. You know what I mean? Like I'm now I know God calls us to be generous regardless. Right. Regardless of all that. But it's easy to be generous with grateful people. But your ingratitude that you probably aren't even aware of. Ultimately, is leaving a mark that's undermining your respectability. And during this time of year is a time that we examine what does it mean to be grateful? But we also got to ask ourselves, are we showing gratitude or ingratitude? You know, the people that I wrote off for being showing ingratitude, they have no clue. They have no clue that they've been written off, right? And the people who wrote you off for showing ingratitude, you have no clue that they wrote you off. <laughs> Right. You have no clue. You have no idea. And I'm sure there's people probably on this call that's hearing me talk about ingratitude. And they're like, yeah, Paris, I remember one time when you did this. Hmm. That's probably Sean Smith. Right. You know, like, I remember one time you did. You didn't do this. So, uh, you know, 
And, and 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 this is this is this is true. And I have no clue who it is except for Sean Smith. You know what I mean? Like, but I have no clue who it is outside of that. You know, and here's the funny thing. And I talked about this last year where I said we get defensive when we are accused of not being grateful. We get defensive because we think that they are saying that we don't feel something. Y'all remember that we talked about this whole concept of what, what, what do you mean? I'm not grateful. I, I feel super grateful for what you did and, and how you took care of me. You know, you don't know how I feel. You can't see my feelings. But I wanted to share this quote, and I think this is a powerful quote, and I'm going to go into the scripture. Unexpressed gratitude is experienced as ingratitude. Unexpressed gratitude is experienced as ingratitude. You know, I've talked to, even when I try to help out parents and we're talking to parents with their kids and different things like that, and they're like, you know, I can't believe my kids act, my teen says that they, I don't love them. What are they talking about? And I'm like, you know, you love your kids with your heart, but do you love your kids with your calendar? With your time? It's your calendar that counts. It's the expression of gratitude that's communicated, not emotion. And when we feel in gratitude, we withdraw parts of ourselves, but our hearts always gravitate towards recognition and gratitude, not a feeling, but a response, you know, and this is the same with Jesus. Um, I want to read uh, this scripture. If we could turn our Bibles to, act, uh, to Luke 17, starting in verse 11. Sorry about that. I got cut off. Okay. Um, it says, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and, Gal and Galilee. He was going into a village. He was going into a village. Ten men who had leprosy met him, and they stood at a distance, and they called out in a loud voice, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourself to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice and threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, weren't all ten cleansed? Where are the others? Nine, has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has healed you. You know, there's a lot you could talk about this, but I just want to hone in on this one point as we go and reflect on our communion. That the one that came back he was not content with feeling grateful. He demonstrated and expressed it. See, the others felt it. Honestly, I'm pretty sure they walked away. And if they were asked, are you not grateful for what Jesus did to you? I'm sure they would be like, yeah, this is Jesus guy. He's great. He's awesome. But did they express it? No. So in closing, Unexpressed gratitude communicates ingratitude. Feelings don't count. How does this look when it comes to your personal relationship with Jesus? As we reflect on the cross, are we showing gratitude through a life, our lives, and how we live, and the things we do, and the things we say, and how we communicate, and how we connect? Or is it all about a feeling? God knows my heart mentality. You know, telling others how grateful you are about someone doesn't count if they haven't seen it or heard it personally from you. So let's be the one to go back and thank the one who helped you and enabled you to move forward. Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, Lord, thank you so much that you came and you healed us. 
I pray, Lord, that uh, we don't just think back on the time that we were baptized as an incredible healing, but we are able to see how you are working in our lives daily, day by day, blessing us. Even in a year that we have experienced now, the fact that we are on this call right now shows that you have bestowed a level of grace and blessings upon us. And that I pray that we always show gratitude to, towards you. I pray that we aren't ashamed to come back and show the world how much we love you. We thank you for your sacrifice, which you did on the cross for us. And we pray that we can live a life worthy of your sacrifice, expressing gratitude as we move forward. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
a song before the sermon uh, that Katen will be giving us this morning. Amen, Katen. Uh, you'll do a great job. Let's uh, sing Woke Up This Morning. Hey, how are you? Good morning. Psalm 95 verse 1 says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Because see, when I woke up this morning, the one thing I was glad is that I woke up. <laughs> that God gave me another day of life. Let's sing. One, two, one, two, one, two, three. I woke up this morning with my mind and it was staying on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind and it was staying on the Lord. I woke up this morning with my mind, and it was staying on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, well, I'm singing and praising with my mind, and it was staying on Jesus. I'm singing and praising with my mind, because it was staying on the Lord. I'm singing and praising with my mind, cause it was staying on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Ha, I'm walking and talking with my mind, cause it was staying on Jesus. I'm walking and talking with my mind, cause it was staying on the Lord. I'm walking and talking with my mind, cause it was staying on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I love to pray Him. Woo! I love to praise His name. I love to pray Him. Woo! I love to praise His name. I love to pray Him. I love to praise his name. Oh, I love to praise his holy name. Oh, when I woke up this morning with my mind, cause it was staying on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind, and it was staying on the Lord. I woke up this morning with my mind, cause it was staying on Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.
Amen. Hello? Can everyone hear me? All right. Here. I'm so excited to speak for you today. <laughs> so uh, the title for today's sermon is Promises. Really excited to be able to talk about the topic with everyone. But before we get started, why don't we jump into a little bit of prayer? So... Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this time today to be able to talk and share with so many friends and loved ones, Lord. I pray that the message would be good, Lord, that it would be pleasing to your ear and that everyone is just able to uh, enjoy the sermon and learn from the sermon, Lord. And I pray that we're all able to take a little slice of it and apply it to our life in whatever way we can. So I thank you for all your gifts, God, and I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. All right, so... For those of you who do not know me, my name is Caden. I graduated from Princeton in the spring slash summer when the virus struck. So that was great. And I was a part of the Princeton campus ministry. I didn't grow up Christian. I My family's from Virginia, but over the summer, my freshman year, when I was back in Virginia, I got baptized and I chose to make Jesus Lord of my life. And so that's kind of my experience and where I'm coming from. It's nice. So the more important thing that you guys hear about is the sermon today and what we're actually going to be talking about. And the inspiration for this sermon kind of came from our last sermon that we had with Central. And so Matt Weber, great guy, love him, did a wonderful sermon on Noah. And so he was talking about the story of Noah, what led up to the story of Noah and what happened in Noah's story. Awesome guy. He had a family. The world was going through a lot of the time and God ultimately decides to send this flood. And so Noah is told to build this ark and him, his family and animals, right? The animals of the world are brought onto the boat and are protected from the floods. And so after the floods end and Noah and all the animals step off the ark, they're in this new world. And so the big transition for that was, okay, in this new world that is created, in this new kind of blank slate that we are left with, it is very similar to the kind of blank slate that we are made as people who follow God, right? If we make the decision to follow God. And so the whole idea was God makes us new. And then he dove into a couple of key truths about what being new was or wasn't, right? He talked about how new isn't always planned, right? We didn't expect coronavirus. It is new. That's rough. <laughs> Other things. New isn't always easy, right? And so the example he gave for this was getting the Ikea bed. That Ikea bed is definitely new, but when you get it from the box, you definitely can't sleep on it because you will just be sleeping on a pile of wood. So new sometimes needs to be put together or it needs to have some additions or some work put into it for it to actually be functional. The next thing was new is maintained, right? Something that is new, something that is good needs work put into it. And finally ended with new can sometimes be the best of things, right? And so being given this opportunity to have kind of a new life and a new identity in God is really powerful. And some of the best memories you can have can be made through that. Now, I was like, amen, Matt, that's cool. Love your points, great guy, but I really felt like there was a lot more that could have been told about the story of Noah. And especially when it comes to Old Testament texts, I don't, think, I don't think that we always give them the amount of critical thinking that is kind of due in order to really get the most out of the story. And so this is one of the images that Matt took from Wikipedia that I also took from Wikipedia to throw in this presentation because I really want Noah's story to do to be the focus for today's sermon. And so in order to really get a little deeper into our sermon, the first thing that we wanna do is understand the context of this world. Now, the flood, right? Big point, big issue. It has a lot to do with Noah's story. It has a lot to do with what happens with Noah in relationship with God. And so if you look at this ancient world, there's a ton of other stories globally, right? So as a historical occurrence, 
it happens all over the place. There's accounts in China, there's accounts in uh, Africa, there's accounts in what would have been the Americas at the time, but in the same place as where this story, the story of Noah's happened, right, in Mesopotamia, there are a number of different groups that we know existed at the same time and have their own stories about the flood. And so I don't want to dive too deep into this, but I'll just throw out a couple. So the Sumerians, the Babylonians, Egyptians who are kind of close. One of the most prevalent stories is a story uh, or the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? And the Epic of Gilgamesh also has God. It also has these people and these figures who are talking about this flood, talking about this relationship between God and people. And so it's not quite the same, right? Because as we're going to see in a second in Noah's story, there's a couple things that stand out about it. But the reason why the gods sent the floods in the Epic of Gilgamesh was because they were mad. They're like, man, these people messed up. Something has to be done about them. In some other flood stories in the same area, part of it is attributed to things like overpopulation. The people were treated like pests, right? It's kind of like fleas on a fleas on a dog, right? And I guess in this weird comparison, the dog is the earth and we are the fleas. And so the gods were like, I don't like that. And so please wash them away through a flood. Rough. Now, one of the things, right, that happens in a lot of these stories is typically the hero of the story ends up being a person, right? It ends up being a dude who gets a bit of extra information is like, yo, this is okay. Like they're trying to wipe us out. We're fleas. We're going to, we're going to make it. We, we have sturdiness. Right. And so they make it and oop nap, oop is one example of one of these stories. And so he survives and actually he's turned into a God at the end of the story. And so there's this really heavy focus on man in these stories, but now, why don't we jump over into Noah's story and take a quick look at it. So I chose this passage to look through and everything that we're looking through today, besides like one little other part of scripture is contained within this passage. So I'm going to read it real quick to everyone. I'm going to read it with a bit of pace because you'll understand in a minute. So Genesis 9, 8 to 17, it says, then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is a sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant, covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. Wow. Now, two things kind of stand out about this. First is God is really sold on this covenant. And the second thing is this is to any modern day reader, very, very poorly written. Um, it, it is a rough one, right? If, if we just talk from like a high level perspective, I'm a literature teacher, some prophet submits this to me. He's like, I've you know, worked really hard on this. I wanna know what your thoughts are. The reader would say, okay, well, you talk about never destroying life again twice in your passage. You talk about establishing it with all living things at least like three or four times in the same passage, right? you say the word covenant a ton of times, right? The word covenant appears a bunch of times. And the literary teacher would probably be like, ah, this is probably like a C minus, right? You'd be like, ah, you know, I, I don't want to read this. But there's a bunch of different reasons for why this paragraph is structured as so. One is it takes on a older form of a more po poetic form 
to really emphasize certain aspects and certain parts. But I'm not going to go too deep into that. There's other resources that are great on this that go into a lot more depth. But I really want to emphasize one part of it. And part of the power of using this kind of approach is you really emphasize things, right? So I'm just going to point out the word covenant, right? Again, the title of the sermon is Promises. The word covenant appears eight times in these nine verses. That's a lot of times. That's, that's almost one for one in every single sentence. Now, again, in English class, you're told not to be that repetitive, but here it's special because if you compare it to a lot of the other flood stories, this promise is super, super significant. No one looks at it and goes like, wow. And no one looks at it and goes like, yeah, that's just like every other God. This God is like trying to destroy everything, right? Like that being said, God did send the floods. I'm not going to focus too much on that, but this covenant is what stands out as what sets aside this story from the rest. And so knowing that this covenant makes this story extremely different, it is good to jump into a little bit more about, okay, what is this covenant? And the line that really stands out is this one, right? I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth, right? God chose a rainbow. Now rainbows are super cool. We draw them in preschool. They're awesome. We keep them around. We love them. Every time we see one of them, maybe we're like watering our garden with Garden hose, we're like, oh my gosh, it's a rainbow. It's so pretty, right? But why the rainbow? And it's interesting because the moment you start to dissect the scripture and its translation a little more, you find out that in some translations, it's not even a rainbow, right? In some translations, ESV, some other NLT, right? It is, translation, it is translated as my bow instead of rainbow. And as you start to dissect this image a little more, you go like, okay, so God intentionally chose a bow as this covenant, right? There's a bunch of different covenants that you end up seeing in the Old Testament. Most of the times they're like a stone, right? But here God has chosen to use a bow. Now I've kind of isolated this image so that we can get a clearer picture of it. Now, Hopefully everyone here can tell me what a bow and arrow is used for, right? Now, a bow is not very useful unless you have an arrow in it, right? And if we think about the rainbow and how it's pointed and positioned in the sky, where does that arrow fly, right? When we shoot that arrow up, the arrow flies up and it points straight to God, right? Which is awesome because once we notice this, right, once we notice that this covenant and the object with which this covenant is made is very, very special, it's very intentional, we begin to be able to dive a little deeper into how God views promises and the promises that we make with God and with people, right? And so the focus of this lesson is using God's promise in Noah's story to better understand what godly promises look like, what we can use to critically evaluate our promises so that we can develop, right, the nature of our promises and how we are challenging ourselves and putting ourselves out there. And so that's Noah's story. Again, this one symbol that didn't really appear in other flood stories becomes something that lasts forever, right? We still see rainbows. And so focus now, instead of just jumping to the New Testament is, okay, what can we learn about promises? Now, the first point I want to cover is that promises are weighty. Now, has anyone here ever had a bow and arrow pointed right at you? Okay, well, Paris, that's great. Nice try. Also, if anyone gets the reference from the photo, It is not from Lord of the Rings. It might be from Lord of the Rings, but you can't tell with a smiley face covering it. I'm just saying. So if you just take a second and imagine, right, a bow and arrow pointed straight at you, you're probably not like, oh, this is great. Oh, I, oh, this, this is lovely. Oh my, you know, I woke up out of bed. I was like, "Mm." okay, well, Remy, yeah, 
I guess a gun does count as well. I mean, they're both kind of intimidating. Probably the gun a little more intimidating, but point being, you're not happy about it. Like you're focused when a bow is pointed at you, right? You're focused when you're put into this position where a weapon is pulled on you, right? And if it's, it's weird, right? Because you think about it and you're like, oh, wow. So God literally chose to keep a weapon perpetually pointed at himself to remember. So thinking to our promises then, do we treat them in a similar way, right? When, when we're put into that position where there is a weapon right in front of us, we kind of enter fight or flight, right? You, you feel everything in your body, right? You're thinking, right? You're, you're critical. You're trying to evaluate what's happening, where you are, what you're going to do. Because you're going to do something in that situation, right? You're, you're going to either fight or you're going to fly, right? And so do your promises make you feel everything in your body, right? Do they put you in that fight or flight where you are thinking critically about what's going on in your life? What's going on with you? Does it make you reflect on who you are, where you are, where you're at, what you're doing, right? Because if it's not, right, how heavy is that promise? And so in terms of having weighty promises, in some ways it almost feels like they attack us right? They're getting us to dig deeper, to self-reflect and to be engaged with ourselves. So that's the first point, that promises are weighty, that you can feel the weight of your promises. The next point is that they're haunting, right? And I chose to use this word haunting instead of, I was thinking present before, because if we think of the nature of rainbows, they kind of just appear out of nowhere, right? We don't walk out the door and be like, I'm going to see a couple rainbows today. It's going to be real good. Double rainbow, triple rainbow. Amen. It's, it's not really an expectation, but we know what it is immediately when we see it, right? We, we talk about it. We ex- we're excited about it when we see rainbows because they're so pretty. But if we think about the occurrence of rainbows where they are, they're... I mean, one, they're a scientific phenomena. Amen, love refraction. But they're everywhere, right? You see them all over the place. And so in terms of what that means for your promises, right? How often are you reminded of your promises? If, if like other Old Testament symbols, you use, say, a memorial stone or an altar to honor or a well in some cases, if you use those, those are stationary objects that manifest in one physical space at a time. I won't go into like quantum theory on how they can exist everywhere at all times, but that physical object exists there. You don't expect that thing to bam, be everywhere, but rainbows are different. Rainbows are everywhere, right? So when you are walking through your life, when you're thinking about your promises what you've made to yourself, to other people, do your promises make you stop and think, right? Do, do they, are there signs in your life that pop up every now and then to remind you of your promise? Does your promise feel present? Does it feel like it's still affecting you and relevant in your life today? Because if it's not, then it's not really like a rainbow, right? A rainbow can appear anywhere. A rainbow appeared in this presentation. (laughs) Surprise. Now, this is the second point, right? Not only do we have those fight or flight responses to our promises. Well, hopefully you're not always fighting and flighting, but there's this heaviness to your promises that you're feeling. And you're feeling that heaviness on occasion. It's not just a one and done. You're in that fight or flight and then, oh, cool. Like I had that experience. I will talk about that every now and then at a cocktail party and talk about how that was so intense. No, I mean, you're, you're going through it, 
Right. It, it happens. It comes back. It revisits you so that you remember, right? It's present. It's haunting. It sticks with you. It's memorable. And the last thing is promises are lasting, right? I'm not talking about like those wishy-washy promises where you're like, ah, yes, I will hang out with you. I would love to spend time with you. Oh no, everything in the world has popped up. I am no longer able to spend time with you. I am so sorry. See you next time. And we'll talk about this again and repeat this conversation for the rest of our lives, right? No, that, that's not what we're talking about. A promise is made in the long term. We're, we're talking about the long game, baby. If all your promises are in the short term, right? And you're not really holding to them. They just forget, right? One, the, the hauntingness doesn't actually stick, right? But the everlasting aspect of it, right? It says everlasting covenant. This lasting aspect thinks to the long term. It thinks to characteristics, to issues, to topics, to anything that pops up in life that happens. It's, it's a promise made regardless of situation. When God came down and said, I'm not going to do this again. I will be with you, right? That was a promise forever. Doesn't matter how messed up we are, right? It doesn't matter how badly we do things or how much we hurt other people or how much we hurt ourselves. I'm with you, right? I'm not going to do the same thing even if you fall back into the same world that you did when I decided to send the floods. The choice this time was different. And to speak to this with a bit of an analogy on my own, some of you have probably picked this up, but in terms of godly promises, right? One of the godly promises that I've made in my life was to follow Christ, right? That was a big godly decision because that's when I decided you know, things can be really hard in life. Things might not always be great, but I'm going to do my best to root my life in God. And going a step further, actually, when I entered the waters, right, when I was baptized, one of the things that really touched my heart was I want to do my best to learn every single day how I can be a better person, how I can be a better friend, and how I can help people's lives. That was a promise I made to myself, right? There's, I'm, you know, you could go to the Bible and be like, okay, uh, I found this biblical scripture. Oh, yeah, let's make a promise based on that. But this was personal, right? It wasn't so much I found the scripture. I'm like, wow, the scripture, I have to obey the scripture. It was something I felt deep in my heart that I knew that going into the waters, that is something I wanted to bind my life to for the rest of my days with my love for God that I wanted to do. And uh, coronavirus, <laughs> in this season, it's been so hard. It's been awful. Um, for those who know me, for who, those who don't know me, right? One thing that I've shared with the church previously and with some close friends is I struggle a lot with mental health. I have been f since before I became Christian. In fact, one of the reasons why I chased God with such intensity was because I needed something. I needed something to lean on. I needed something to, to wake up to and feel every day, right? To, to drive me, to help me understand a little bit about why the world is the way it is and what can actually make it work, what can actually make it better. And in this coronavirus season, it's been awful. I have had loved ones, family members, friends go through some of the worst things they've had in their life. I had a friend who lost two friends to self-harm in one year. I had a friend find out they have cancer. I had <laughs> count more than a dozen people lose family members to cancer. I had a friend's mother get run over by a truck and now she's an orphan. I've had friends stuck in hurricanes. I've had friends who are trapped in countries on their way to try to go home because they're not from America and just get stuck there for at the time it was like a month or so and they were just fending for themselves and on their own. 
I had friends who've been struggling with their faith. I've, I've had friends who are struggling with being alone in this season. And it was hard, right? I told myself I would be there for them. I told myself that I had to, not just for God, right? For, the, for this promise I made to myself that I would be there for them. And you know, the happy ending kind of like story that most people would probably want or expect is, oh, well, Caden, you did that, right? You stuck with those promises. Like you, you did all you could. And yeah, I did do all I could, but I, it was like an Icarus thing, right? I was up there flying in the sky. I flew too, I flew too close to the sun and it burned and it burned really hard for a long time. And so over the last couple of months, it's been super hard to readjust and figure my own life out. You know, one of the things that I realized about my promise or that I thought was about my promise, but wasn't was when I chose to make God first, I decided to put the burden of my life on God. I said, I'm living for God. I'm living for the purpose that he has set aside for me. And I'm following that, right? I'm living for the, what I said when I wanted to help people. Amen, that sounds good on paper, but that's not right. What I realized is I had used God or the grace of God, right? Because even God's grace isn't God himself. I had used that grace as kind of an excuse to step away from the hard question of, are these my promises? Are these my decisions? Because it's different to say, God told me to live and to say, I want to live. And I want to live for God every day. And so godly promises aren't easy, right? In this season where it felt like my soul was getting pulled apart from seeing all these people I love just go through it. That, that promise stayed. And it haunted me. Right. I would wake up sometimes just not want to get out of bed or I just crawl over to my computer and just start watching YouTube videos to try and like forget about things or not feel anything. And that promise would haunt me. The promise that I had said that I would be there for other people and that I was trying, but it was still hard. And so those are the kinds of promises that God makes with us, right? These are the kinds of promises that we can make for God, but these are also the kinds of promises that can affect people. Now, we have a bunch of people from all kinds of different backgrounds in the call today. But there's a question I want to ask you guys. And it's, what godly promises have you made? If you're someone who, you know, doesn't really know God, uh, amen, cool, that's awesome. Do you have promises in your life that you can reflect on and apply this to? Have, have you promised yourself to anything, right? Have you held yourself to a certain standard? Or are there things that you really care about and value that stick with you, that you, you want to pursue and know? And can you apply these standards and see whether they really fit, whether they're really good, right? It's important. Because these standards make a difference, right? These standards change us. They, they cause us to think more critically and to take action, right? If you're someone who does say that you follow and love God, okay, well, what does your godly promise look like then? What is your relationship to God? Who is God to you? And what do you do for God? What, what is, or what are the circumstances, right? That you find yourself staring down the shaft of that arrow pointed right at you. Because if you don't have those moments, how clearly do you remember that promise? And was it a godly promise when you made it? And so the last question I also want to finish with to get you guys to, you know, I like sparking thought. What is your bow? Do you have a bow 
or an object or a manifestation of your promise? What is the thing that pops up in your life repeatedly that helps you to remember? It's going to look a little different for everyone, right? For me, I can share a little bit. It's been going back to a lot of my first loves. Funnily enough, I, well, I really like video games. And in playing video games, I reconnected with these friends who I have never met in real life. I met them seven years ago and they helped me immensely more than I can even put into words this season, just playing video games. I shared with them for the first time about my mental health history, seven years. And they were there for me. They were, they sent me like pictures of their dogs and it was nice. Their dogs are really, really cute. Besides friends, right? Other first loves. I remember just how much or where that love for serving people came from, right? It, it came from like seeing people smile. I used to help build homes for Habitat for Humanity. And a lot of those families had kids and I'd get to, you know, hang out with their kids for a while. And they would talk about how much they loved their new home. And then we'd like play ball in front of those homes. And those moments were so special, right? Those moments reminded me or continue to remind me of why I made that promise. What is your bow, right? What are the things that are keeping you to your promise that are, that are keeping you grounded and rooted in change, right? In believing in yourself in pushing through anything that this season can push towards you. I acknowledge coronavirus is hard. I acknowledge a global pandemic is not easy. I've been there too. But if I let this pandemic or other people keep me on my back, then I will have forgotten the promise that I made. So that is my sermon for today. I leave you guys with a psalm that really encouraged me through this season. And I'll read it real quick. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow but he frustrates the way of the wicked. Thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoyed this sermon. <laughs> Man. Okay. Can you hear me now? Thank you, Caden. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, even just the, the analogy with the bow, that was incredible. Uh, just really great points. I, I don't think I'm going to look at rainbows the same. Um, <laughs> you know, that's, that was really powerful. Yeah, so we really appreciate that, Caden. And um, guys, so with that, you know, as we normally do, we're going to go into our breakout rooms. I think that children's ministry will be... Um, going on at 11.30, so the parents, if you need to uh, transfer over for your children to connect uh, with children's ministry, uh, that'll be open at 11.30. Um, we also want to encourage people to, take, to partake in the breakout rooms and the discussion questions. We're going to really just take it from what Caden shared, and let's talk about it. Uh, he left us with two really good questions to, to, to discuss and to fellowship with. Uh, those two questions are, uh, what godly promise have you made? And what is your bow? Uh, what is your bow? So if we can uh, discuss those within your breakout rooms, please take advantage of that. It's a great time to connect uh, with one another. And again, Caden, we truly appreciate uh, what you shared, your effort and the work you put into that, uh, into this message. It was powerful. And that PowerPoint, you know, I'm, I'm done with you showing off with this PowerPoint stuff. Like so the translate, uh, the transition's got to be clean. Oh, gosh. Oh, oh, but I mean, it was smooth. It was smooth. I mean, the boat thing, that, that was a, that was a, that was a hundred dollar move. Thank you so much though for that. 
Uh, guys, let's go into our breakout rooms and we'll, we'll, we'll spend some time fellowshipping. Uh, for those who have to leave, we love you and we'll see you next week. She's down the room. Hey, Yasin. Yasin. Hey. Hi. Oh, look at him. He like the hey, sun is in my eye. eye. <laughs> All that sun in my eye. Uh, <laughs> Kenny, thank you so much with the welcome. You did great with it. Thank you. Yeah, I go, hey, put me in next time, coach. <laughs> <laughs> you killed it. Thanks so much, brother. We really appreciate that. You can do it a few more times, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I got you. You know what I mean? Don't don't tempt me, Kenny. Right. Don't tempt me. <laughs> Y'all will have you as the welcome man. <laughs> nah, here we go. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, let me jump in this breakout room, see what's going on in here. I'll see you later. Uh, Karen, Sean, JP, come on. There we go. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, sh yeah, Sean, thank you. Horatio, Horatio, Horatio.